Hello, I'm Keith Ghostland. I'm Ann Charles. And I'm Linda Quinlan. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. It's October 22nd, uh, Tuesday, and um, I guess we'll start with our headlines. Keith? And, and we're off and running. First thing is our trivia question, because I keep forgetting it. Out in the Mountains, October 2006, article about a Vermont Supreme Court ruling in the Miller Jenkins lawsuit. Why <coughs> would we care about that? And then looking very, very quickly, the Vermont Coalition for Ethnic and Social Equity in Schools, the coalition has appointed, and the press release will be going act, out actually today, of the 11 community members who have been appointed to serve on this task force, three of whom may have identified as being part of the LGBTQ plus spectrum. You can find out who by going on the coalition's website and reading the bios. There is a pos two positions specifically for youth, there is a, pos a position, <laughs> new lips, <laughs> for the indigenous communities, mm -hmm. LGBTQ, people with disabilities, all of the people who should be at the table have been invited to be at the table. Good. Very so, good. Very brief comment. Current discussion happening within the LGBTQ news network we need to be very conscious right now that as the impeachment inquiry moves forward, that 45 will target the LGBTQ plus community mm -hmm. for greater restrictions and pullback of positive policies because it's the one way he can secure himself with his base. Mm -hmm. That was part of his campaign promise. <coughs> Today, this month is LGBTQ History Month. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that have been pointed out that we got wrong. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm going to talk about Vermont specific events, including a very exciting poetry reading that might be happening <laughs> at the Kellogg Covered Library. And speaking of poetry readings, you may notice our striking outfits. Yes. We're wearing them in solidarity with one of our number who will be celebrated <laughs> on the show with an interview and with our praise, our ongoing respect and praise. My headlines are as follows. Good news from Northern Ireland. Finally, it's going to legalize abortion and same-sex marriage. And this Yay. happened last night. It was a little bit of a squeaker. Bad news from Hong Kong, a serious setback for equal marriage. Uganda news, I hate to even report it. A Uganda government spokesperson says there are no plans to reintroduce the Kill the Gays bill, but a uh, prominent activist was brutally killed. Um, so we'll get to that. I have good news from Brazil involving a Bra Brazilian drag queen named um, Pablo Vitar. Uh, good news about Mariela Franco, and let me just tell you, um, as you know, she was assassinated in Rio. Um, she's the first ever LGBTQI person to be nominated for the Sakharov Prize. A j more good news from Brazil. A judge orders Brazil to reinstate the funding for films in an LGBT victory. I mentioned that last time. There were, you know, they had cut off funding for 80 films because Bolsonaro was worried that four of them had gay content. But now a judge has ruled that the whole action was illegal. I have very interesting news about the London production of The Color Purple, and I'd like to elicit responses Ooh. from my fellow panelists. And then stories I'm not going to get to, probably. A Reading Chick-fil-A outlet to close. <laughs> in London, right? In England. I yeah. saw that. My LGBT that. rights row. Coca-Cola has been fined for pro-LGBTQ ads in Hungary. And I have a picture now of the ads. They're appealing. The decision. 
a Danish pro hockey player, John Lee Olson, comes out as gay, and I have a picture of him. He's very happy to have done it. His team is supportive. Um, an American anti-LGBTQIA preacher condemns New Zealanders after he was denied entry to New Zealand. <laughs> His name is Stephen Ambrose <laughs> of the Faithful country. World Baptist Church. Was yeah. he trying to bring Chick-fil-A takeout? <laughs> no, <laughs> he was going to cause a little trouble in New Zealand, but he was excluded from entry to the country. Good. Uh, unfortunately, the World Congress of Families is prepping for an African conference yeah. with supporters of anti-gay laws. And when I mentioned yeah. the story about Ghana last time and the special education program they're initiating, Linda said with great foresight, now the, pre the anti-gay preachers from the U.S. are going to go over there. And lo and behold, Brian Brown, uh, who is head of World Conference of the Family and the International organization of the family is headed to this conference in Accra wow. where he's going to cause as much trouble Evil as Evil walks can. among us. Okay, what you need to prophesize is he goes over there and he doesn't come back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or at least, you know, eggs, have eggs thrown at him. Oh, but, yeah, like potatoes. like the, the So those are my like. headlines. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay. Well, there's a little bit of a row at uh, Baylor a row? University. Yeah. A row? Yeah, a row. Where? <laughs> at Baylor University, oh. which we'll get to. And Miley Cyrus says she thought she had to be gay because men are evil. <laughs> I know. Is Miley Cyrus gay? She said she was at one point, but she, is she felt she had to because she thought men were evil. She oh, now, strange. She now identifies as pansexual. Yeah. It could change tomorrow. <laughs> what a strange story. <laughs> now there's a cereal we can all get behind. Yes. <laughs> you can eat and support LGBTQ equality <clears throat> at the same time. The Human Rights Campaign has joined forces with Honey Nut Cheerios to help raise funds for LGBTQ people. So that's good news. Um, I happen to like Honey Nut Cheerios. And that cereal is distinctive looking, isn't it? It is. It is. It's got like, I don't know, a like a gay sugar. honey nut. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Billy Porter. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got these allergies. Billy Porter recently said the music industry, industry is hugely and violently homophobic and sabotaged his early career. However... Mr. Porter will be playing the fairy godmother in the new Cinderella movie. I can't wait I to can't see that. I can't wait. I know. Mm -hmm. A little story about Rowan Farrell. Um, uh, ben Shapiro. William Barr. Shep Smith. Oh, my goodness. I know. Savannah Georgia is having its pride parade and celebrations on October 24th through the 29th. Susan Collins, which you probably know about in Maine, is presently polling at 33%. We love that. I hope it's going down, down. A country yes. commissioner in Tennessee was caught on video ranting about how the U.S. has a queer running for president. It's time to wake up. It's time. It's past time, said Sevier County Commissioner Warren Hurst, Republican, at a meeting yesterday about an ordinance to make the county a gun sanctuary. So we'll have more about that uh, later in the program. All we need so, is a gun sanctuary. Yeah. <laughs> well, if it's a gun sanctuary, then they're over there and we can keep them there? <laughs> they, they can't observe the guns. They like can't come off life. the sanctuary? <laughs> <laughs> okay, looking at events coming up that you're going to want to participate in, November 4th, Kellogg Hubbard Library at 7 o'clock. <laughs> Someone might be reading selected works from Chelsea Creek, and it might be our own Linda Quinlan. On Sunday, if you're watching this Saturday night, set your alarm clock, get up early tomorrow morning, 
Sunday at one o'clock in the afternoon. No good. At Perky Planet, Perky which is Planet, which is on St. Paul Street in Burlington. Oh. Women's Coffee Social. Oh. They're looking at and it's sponsored by the Pride Center. They're looking at trying to make it at least a monthly event. Hmm. That same afternoon. Don't even have to come home. Is it going to be like once a month, you think? Yeah, well, no, th that's, what, that's what they're trying okay, to. Okay, once a month, okay. There is a community potluck that afternoon, 5 o'clock at the Pride Center. Uh -huh. Oh, my gosh. You know, make your best casserole. <laughs> and then on Monday night is Women's Game Night. What date? This is Monday the 28th. Okay. So, no, this is all in succession. It's like the day Monday, after we Tuesday, air. Yeah. And there we go. So it looks as though the Pride Center is starting to reach out. Let's see how sustained their action is. Reach out to women? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Now if they could. I wish I could do this Sunday, but we already have tickets to the theater, don't we? Saturday. Oh, Saturday. Well, morning. I was going to say, now if they could only make it past Burlington. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. True. Oops. Oops. On Wednesday, October 30th, is the LGBTQ plus town hall forum being sponsored by the Alliance and Rainbow Umbrella, 6 o'clock at the Montpelier Senior Center. This is an opportunity for, for our communities to come together and say, this is what we need, rather than somebody telling us, this is what we can do for you. Right. <coughs> this is our opportunity to say, this is truly what would be helpful for us. This is where we are stubbing our toes or this is what is working well. And specifically the people who <coughs> are traditionally left out, our youth and our seniors, Yeah, please come. And this is going to be repeated statewide, but Wednesday the 30th is when it's happening here in Montpelier. And the Kellogg Hybrid Library also on Monday the 28th at 6.30, is their LGBTQ plus book and film series. Yep. They're going to be discussing the book Picture Us in the Light, which is a young adult novel written by Kelly Loy Gilbert, and it's co-sponsored by the Unitarian Church. Okay. And I was hoping you had read a review of it so you could comment, but <laughs> the no. face you're me making is like, what is that? You know, actually, I think I own it, but I haven't read oh, it. Oh, okay. That's why I was... Furrowing my brow. Is that okay? It was cerebration. All right, uh, Northern Ireland, good news. Um, it was decided um, at the 11th hour. There was an attempt to block the change, but it collapsed into a farce. Uh, the new legislation puts the House of Commons on track to legislate for marriage equality by January 2020, paving the way for same-sex couples to wed yeah. on Valentine's Day. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of festivities in Northern Ireland on Valentine's Day. Uh, the abortion law that was also passed obliges the UK to ensure regulations for free legal and local abortion services uh, make sh making sure that they're in place by the 31st of March 2020. After midnight, that's last midnight, yesterday at midnight, there'll be a moratorium on criminal prosecutions, halting police investigations into abortion cases, including a case against a mother who faced jail for buying her then 15-year-old daughter abortion pills online. Uh, in 2014, <coughs> When I needed an abortion and was denied one, I swore I would add my voice to the campaign for abortion rights, and to have achieved that is just incredible, said Ashley Tuffley, who was part of the Supreme Court challenge to the ban. So good, good. news. Good going. Now in Hong Kong, I wish Bad I news. could report the same thing. But They're I'll, having a terrible time anyway. In general. Yeah. yeah. Well, the background is that <coughs> MK, a Hong Kong woman in a same-sex relationship filed an application for judicial review at the High Court in June 2018, claiming that the government was breaching her constitutional rights to privacy and equality. The case was heard at the end of May of this year. 
Currently, Hong Kong only <coughs> legal recognizes marriages as between a man and a woman and does not recognize same-sex marriage or civil partnership or any other form of legal union. The High Court in this MK case held that same-sex couples in Hong Kong had no constitutional right to marry under the territory's basic laws. Uh, the case follows two other recent landmark decisions that went in the other directions in which Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal held that the blanket denial of specific marriage benefits to same-sex <coughs> couples legally married or in civil partnerships overseas could not be justified and amounted to sexual orientation discrimination. So if you're living in Hong Kong and a citizen, you can't get married or have a civil partnership. But if you got married overseas, you can. Wow. Um, and representative of Amnesty International Hong Kong said, sadly, the discriminatory treatment of same-sex couples will continue for the time being. The result is deeply disappointing, but will not dampen the fight for LGBTIA rights in Hong Kong. We stand in solidarity with LGBTI people in Hong Kong and all those who bravely campaign for equal rights. The Hong Kong authorities must stop stigmatizing people based on who they are. Mm. So a setback there. I'd like, I have two Uganda stories, uh, if I may. There was- You can only do one now. Oh, you want to wait till your next segment and do both. Well, I definitely want to get to the good news from Brazil <laughs> and the color purple. Because you want comment on the <laughs> yes, color purple. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So? So, uh, minister in Uganda stirred up a lot of controversy by saying he wants the return of what is called the Kill the Gays oh, Bill, which was, yeah. you know, in the original form, it included the death penalty but then in 2014, it was introduced. Um, it was dismissed. Uh, a version came up and was passed, and Obama um, boycotted the Museveni regime, um, saying that, and he cut human U.S. aid to Uganda. So uh, Uganda struck it, struck down the Anti-Homosexuality Act on a technicality. So this... Um, but now they're probably getting piles of money. <laughs> well, um, this deplorable ethics and integrity minister, Simon Lakoto, said his country's current penal law is limited, limited. So he stirred up all this, the, you know, controversy and coverage, but Uganda has backtracked and said it doesn't plan to institute um, kill the gays bill. However, um, in tandem with this, on October 6th, uh, Brian Waswa, 28, a very active human rights advocate, was murdered um, in his home. He'd worked as a paralegal, paralegal for human rights awareness, and um, he was beaten with a hammer in his home, taken to the hospital. Activists wanted him moved to a better hospital in Kampala. He died en route. So um, three other gay and transgender people have been killed in Uganda in recent months amid the climate of increasingly hostile statements by politicians about LGBT rights. On August 1st, a group of motorcycle taxi drivers beat a young transgender woman to death near Kampala. Um, the organization the young man who was recently killed belonged to has also experienced previous violent attacks. In February 2018, two security guards were seriously injured during a violent break-in at the organization's Kampala offices. And a security guard there was beaten to death. No one has been brought to justice. So, you know, they have, they don't really kill the gays bill, but it's still awful in Uganda. When you have yeah. hate speech, you have action that accompanies it. You don't need well, legislation. Well, you know, Trump will probably give them more money to have to pass the kill the gay bill. Well, well <coughs> it, they're not going to pass it, but. Yeah, not now. 
But um, anyway. So tell me some fun stuff. Well, there is well, Ronan, Ronan Farrow mm -hmm. proposed to John Lovett in a draft of his new book. It was so kind of romantic. Um, his new book is called Catch and Kill, and he said that he he put. They used to pass notes because he uh, Lovett was helping him with editing, mm -hmm. and um, so they had notes often in the uh, manuscript, and so he put a proposal in the manuscript, and uh, John said yes, and um, so they'll be getting married. All right. Very that good? Nice. That's good news. And he's kind of directly out of the closet now. Yes, he, and you know, love it. He's around about it. Yeah. They met, I guess, in 2011 when Lovett love it wrapped up his time as a speechwriter for Barack Obama. Mm. So. And that new book is supposed to be pretty hot. Yeah, I heard an interview on NPR. It was pretty good. Yeah, it talks about NBC backing off yeah. from the Harvey Weinstein story. Right. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. of course. Parents lash out after Georgia school adds trans-inclusive policies. Carlton Wilson okayed allowing a trans student to use the bathroom that corresponded with their gender identity. But Wilson says he has received death threats, so his decision is on hold for now. So we can see where that's going. Ben Shapiro, one of another one of our who is he? I'm going to tell you. Good. <laughs> I wondered during the headlines. Well, he was part of the problem in Baylor. Let me just say this: that Baylor. There's the, the school is requiring both this gay organization, which is called Gay, and Youth America, Youth for American Freedom (YAF). They've been having this fight because um, the Christian organization is accused the um, gay organization for ripping down their flyers and trying to disrupt their um, meetings. Meetings, yeah. but one of the things that they're doing is they're inviting Ben Shapiro, who has said that transgenders, transgender is a disease and has attacked the Supreme Court for striking down laws discriminating against, dis uh, laws that decriminalize homosexuality. So these two groups are being ordered into mediation So the by Christians Baylor. invited Ben Shapiro. Yes. To Baylor. Right, and Did then accused come? the gay, well, he has come, yeah, yep. But this is who he is because he comes up again here. Uh, ben Shapiro, who was mentioned as a person speaking at Baylor, has threatened Beto O'Rourke with a gun over his LGBTQ uh. policies. Beto O'Rourke said he would strip churches of their tax exempt status Thank if God. they didn't support same sex marriage. Um, so he's threatened him with a gun. <coughs> and another deplorable on our li a long list is Franklin Graham, who said he will not bow down to the altar of the LGBTQ agenda and would, he would not worship the rainbow flag. Well, who asked him anyway? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know? Is Baylor uh, religious? It's a Baptist church. A it's Baptist a Baptist school, school in yeah, Texas. Right? In Texas, yep. Okay. Yep, I think it's near Houston. It's mm -hmm. fine. It's not in All you Houston. need to say is Texas. I, Texas, I know. Well, he went after Beto yeah. O'Rourke, so yeah. Yeah, so they probably yeah, and and William Barr, our finest Attorney General of the yeah. United States, <laughs> made a speech at Notre Dame, and preached about religious freedom. He decided he decried the rise of secular secularism, and vowed to do all he can to ensure religious freedom in America. We're really, you know. Over the last 50 years, Barr said, religion has been under attack and there has been a steady erosion of religion as a guiding force in our society. This is so. the person who's supposed to be enforcing and protecting us with the separation of church and state? Yes. That same attorney that general? Same one. Okay. And the one who doesn't find any problem with lying as a moral issue. But, you know, that's another story. I say impeach them all, beginning at the top. And thank you, President 
the new president once they're all impeached. Yeah. Oh. Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Warren. Pelosi. Oh, shoot. I, my <laughs> political inclination. I was jumped know, out. I get it. Sorry, right. sorry. And and let me just one more quick story. Um, Shep Smith quits Fox after 23 years with the organization. I don't say Fox News. I just say Fox or Fox Entertainment. Um, <laughs> Them people. Saying, even with our polarized nation, he hopes that the facts will win the day, that truth will matter, that journalism will thrive. Smith called was called out in a tweet in which Trump said the network doesn't work for the United States anymore, aiming it at him. So I think him... I didn't realize he was gay, Shep Smith. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now I know. Yeah, and, you know, apparently... He was out to get him. So, who was out to get Trump? Was Trump out to get, was out yeah, to get him? Yeah, and so because he was critical of yeah, the he was critical. decisions they had made. And if he's hoping that Fox Entertainment will actually do real journalism, um, you know, it's a good thing he retired when he did. So. Entertainment, yeah. yeah. So, so LGBTQ History Month, things we didn't get right, starting with faggot did not derive from the match to burn the bundle of sticks to burn gays because they didn't burn gays. Gays were hung. Mm. That was the punishment. Faggot shows up in a vocabulary of criminal slang. Huh. So it was something that was within some that segment of the culture anyway had nothing to do with anything else. Huh. And as, we've rep as we have had as a trivia question on this show before, Harvey Milk was not the first openly gay elected to public office. It was Kathy Kosashenko, a lesbian who ran for city council in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in 1974, three years before Harvey was elected, and three months before Elaine, Elaine Noble. Noble was elected to the House of Representatives in Massachusetts. The Black Cat Riot in Los Angeles. Was that the donor Trump? No. Never happened. Okay. It was a police raid. What happened is one of the officers was assault, assaulted while trying to take people into custody. And it was one of those scenarios where law enforcement went in plain clothes, just part of the bar scene with the signal, they just started arresting people. Well, the bartender hit one of the police officers. He ended up going to the hospital and we had a riot. <laughs> not, Didn't happen. Okay. not. And the first organized gay rights protest, and Anne got this one, was five years before Stonewall. It was in New York, 1964, and it was a response to, within that year, approximately 2,500 service members were given a less than honorable discharge mm -hmm. because they'd be part of the LGBTQ community. Wasn't a big demonstration, but the people who were in, in attendance were the Daughters of Belitis, Homosexual League of New York. Doesn't that sound like a baseball team? <laughs> yeah. The Mattachine Society and the New York City League for Sexual Freedom. All right. I'll put, a, I'll put that up against Barr's group anytime. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Let me rush through this good news from Brazil because I want to consult my co-hosts about this color purple story. Um, first of all, a Brazilian drag queen makes Time Magazine's next generation leader list. This is Pablo Vitar, a 24-year-old Brazilian drag pop singer who was included along with other rising stars from around the world. Uh, he's established, I'm sorry, she has established herself as someone to watch on many fronts using her platform as a musical star to demand equality for LGBTQ people in Brazil. She uh, identifies as gay and gender fluid. She's become something of an internet sensation in recent years 
racking up a half a billion Spotify streams and a billion YouTube viewers, as well as garnering nine million Instagram followers. Next, as I mentioned, oh, and I have a picture of Pablo before you. Please observe her. Mariella Franco, I have a picture now of her. She's the first ever LGBTI person to be on the Sakharov Prize shortlist. The European Parliament announced the finalists for the Sakharov Prize on October 9th. And for the first time in 30 years, an LGBTQIA person is on the list. As we know, um, Mariella Franco was a Brazilian politician, feminist, and human rights mm -hmm. defender. I have a picture yeah. of her before you now. A black bisexual activist. She fought for the fights of rights of women, young people, uh, favela residents, and LGBTI people in Brazil until she was brutally murdered in March 2018 at the age of 38. She's being honored. And a uh, judge orders Brazil to reinstate the funding for um, the LGBT films, among others. So the four LGBT-themed films are going to be back in production. And uh, Yay. so it's kind of a temporary restraining order, but it's a victory. But now I have a fairly long story, if I may, involving Alice Walker, the <laughs> British um, theater community, and a homophobe who was cast as Seeley. And they took her out, right? They took her out. Yeah. Alice Walker has finally spoken out about the whole, they've both spoken out. So Alice Walker um, says that her being cast in this role was a betrayal. An actress who'd made homophobic comments was fired from the role in the production of the story's musical version earlier this year. Good. Alice Walker says it would be a betrayal um, because um, Aluseye Umuba, who was set to portray Seeley in the production of the musical that ran earlier this year, The Lester Curve, and then the Burlingham Birmingham Hippodrome in England was fired after actor Aaron Lee Lambert shared a 2014 Facebook post in which Amuba called homosexuality a sin, saying it's illegal but not right. So Lambert didn't know her. It's legal but not right. Did I, what did I say? Illegal. illegal. Oh, pardon me. Thank <laughs> you. Please always correct me because I get so caught up in the story I misspeak occasionally. Lambert said a At least you can say practice. <laughs> <laughs> she said, Aaron Lambert said Omuba would be a hypocrite if she played Seeley, who finds love with a woman right. after having been abused by men while holding homophobic views. Last month, Amoeba said she plans to sue Lester Curve over her firing and the Global Artists Agency for dropping her as a client. She, as you probably know, is the daughter of a prominent British anti-LGBTQ activist. Omuba contends that she has suffered discrimination because of her Christian beliefs. <gasps> Walker stayed silent on the matter until this week. And I, now I have don't a, think that'll fly in England, not like it will here. Yeah. In Uganda, maybe. Yeah. Um, let me show you a picture of Alice Walker right now. Yeah. Um, she sent a letter to the color purple, she stayed silent, and then she sent a letter to the color purple producer, Scott Sanders, and authorized him to share the letter on Facebook. In it, she expressed heartfelt compassion for Amuba. Then she explained how she came to create Seeley, and I found this very interesting. Seeley, and this is, I'm quoting from the letter, is based on the life of my grandmother, Rachel, a kind and loving woman brutally abused by my grandfather. It's safe to say after a frightful life serving and obeying abusive men who raped in the place of making love, my grandmother, like Seeley, was not attracted to men, Walker wrote. She was in fact very drawn to my grandfather's lover, a beautiful woman who was kind to her, the only grown person who ever seemed to notice how remarkable and creative she was. In giving Seeley the love of this woman, 
in every way love can be expressed, I was clear in my intention to demonstrate that she too, like all of us, deserved to be seen, appreciated, and deeply loved by someone who saw her as whole and worthy. Walker, who has had relationships with both men and women, said she believes sexual love can be extraordinarily holy, whoever might be engaging in it, and that she urges readers to question the scriptures of all religions. I'll go along with that. Love, however, it may be expressed, is to be honored and welcomed into this light of our common survival as a consciously human race. Playing the role of Seeley while not believing in her right to be loved or to express her love in any way she chooses would be a betrayal of women's right to be free, she concluded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As an elder, I urge all of us to think carefully about what I am saying, even as you, Oluwasi Omuba, sue the theater company for voiding your contract. This is just an episode in your life. Your life, your work, and your growth will continue in the real world. A world we must make safe for women and children, female and male, and the greatest freedom of all is freedom to be your authentic self. Good for her. So yeah. you both agree? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't see it. It's not a First the, Amendment right? No. Or? I mean, because the basis was a homophobic statement. It wasn't that you are Christian. So it. <coughs> it's that you're playing a part or someone who finds mm -hmm. love with another woman, and if you're homophobic, how can you? Okay, do? you're saying is it a violation of First Amendment is it as in freedom of speech? Right, and. You know, I have the right to profess my belief and hold to it and express it. This is one of those situations where the individual, the portrayal of the character is such that you as the person portraying it becomes part of the equation. It is not a separate and distinct, I have this set of beliefs, but I should be yeah. able to portray anyone I want. I, and I agree with Alice Walker that this is a real betrayal of... The intent of her novel. What is being And this is British, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know don't what the British courts have for like... Freedom of speech, freedom yeah. of expression. And, and an argument also could be made that um, Steven Spielberg really repressed the homosexual content. Yes, he did. In the movie. Yeah, that's true. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, so you don't think... No, I think it's... The, I don't um, think so. The actress <coughs> asked to, was asked to retract it when she was fired and uh, refused. Yeah. So how do we think the communities, Christian communities of faith would respond if I were to portray Christ? I know. Then sit back and watch the <laughs> argument. Now there's an idea there I go. can get behind. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just briefly, I wanted to, um, to just talk about this, um, uh, this rant about the family of a queer teen in Tennessee who died this past week after being outed at school, con uh, concerned because the district attorney in charge of this case has made anti-gay comments right. about how he does not treat LGBTQ victims the same as straight victims of violence. <clears throat> Late last month, Channing Smith, 16, was outed on Snapchat. A classmate shared graphic text between Smith and another boy with other students at the school. According to his brother, Smith was freaking out when he saw the message. On Instagram that evening, he wrote, I'm gonna get off social media for a while. I really hate how I can't trust anybody because those I did were so fake. Bye. Later that night, his father found his body. He had died of suicide. His family wants an investigation of the social media messages and their relationship to his death. Smith had been bullied at school and classmates have said that the girl who outed him was just doing it to be mean. But the family is also questioning just how thorough the investigation will be. Smith died in Coffee County, Tennessee, where that district attorney, Craig <coughs> Northcott, is homophobic. <coughs> So anyway, um, 
we'll give you more on that as we get it. So what about uh, trivia? Well, do are we, we going to have an interview? Or? Are we doing the interview first and then Don't trivia? Don't we usually do the yes. interview first? Well, um, I'm going to introduce you myself. <laughs> uh, so let's go to the interview. And for day, for today, this interview is about just a very happy occasion within the All Things family. Because Linda Quinlan, you've had a collection of poetry that's been published. Yes, very exciting. <laughs> and it's called Chelsea Creek. Uh-huh. And that's a very deliberate name, I'm told. It is. It is. And in fact, I went with my daughter-in-law just to get the picture that's on the front, which is um, Mystic River Bridge, and it's in Chelsea, Massachusetts. So. And what might make Chelsea special to Linda Quinlan? Because I grew up there, uh -huh. and it was um, a very interesting community to grow up in, in, especially in the 50s, when most of Boston was pretty segregated. Okay. Chelsea was very diverse. And um, as a community, we had our problems, but we all, um, there were uh, Hispanic, Black, Polish, German, Jewish, Irish, um, all kinds of people. And we all lived in a city that was a mile by a mile wide and managed to um, have fairly good relationships with each other. So, in that sense, it was a it was a it was an interesting place to grow up. And it was a working class. I was going to say strong working class and right. a strong union community. Strong union. Every... Yep. Yep. Okay. So, did you start writing poetry while you were in Chelsea? I did. I um, I had a class uh, in the eighth grade which was on poetry, and um, I wasn't a very good student. I have to say, I had some learning disabilities which at that time were not recognized. But when I saw, when I started reading poetry in this class in the eighth grade, I thought, this is it. This is what I want to do. And I continued doing it to varying degrees throughout my life after that, so. Okay, so what is the it factor for poetry? What's the voice it gave you that other forms of writing didn't? You know, I'm not sure except that um, it gave me a way uh, with a person with few words. Um, okay. And um, it gave me a way to tell a story or an experience or a feeling in a very short and concise way. It fit my personality. And that's a wonderful lead into asking you if you would read one of the poems from your collection. Okay. And, and there's one in particular that seems to reflect those early years in, in Chelsea. Chelsea, yes. So I'm going to read um, okay. Popping Frogs in the 50s. And this will kind of give you an idea what it was like to grow up for probably a lot of people, but particularly for me in Chelsea. So um, Popping Frogs in the 50s. Beside the soldier's home, the, knot, the knotted rope swing pulled between our legs as our bodies swung and our toes touched the leaves below. This was before the boys opened us like the names they carved on bark. They gathered frogs from the pond and threw them under cars just to hear them pop. Us girls held each other's hands and tightened our roller skates with keys. On the stoop, our fathers played poker and laughed at the frog, frog crackers as the heat exploded into twilight. The porch light and shirts went on. I saved as many frogs as I could, but most weren't quick enough to hide in the summer grass. They slipped in oil as thick as mud. I sat down by the pond, making mud pies, listening to my mother yell about polio as if that were the only danger. Thank you. So <clears throat> when you create something like that, is it by inspiration or are you one of those poets 
that has a set time when you sit down and you just write whatever. Inspiration. Totally? Pretty much. Um, I don't have a schedule. Okay. Um, I do have lots of paper and pen around for when things hit me and I may <laughs> want to remember what they are. But no, it's um, mostly inspiration. I get an idea. I start from there. But it could be 10 o'clock at night or it could be 6 in the morning. So I really have no schedule in that way. You're up at 10 o'clock at night? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, the poems in this collection, they span your life. Right. So they weren't written specifically for this collection. Right. You put them together. Yes. How did you choose the poems that would go into this collection? Well, actually, Anne and I put it together, um, and she is <laughs> she is my in resident um, editor, okay, uh, partner, and tremendous help in getting this collection together. But I did it um, kind of. Um, I t a lot of it is about Chelsea and my childhood. Um, some are about New Orleans, which also played a huge uh, part in my life. Um, so they're cho chosen mostly a place, being in a place, and what that means and how that reflects what kind of person I am. So it has a lot to do with place. Okay, so place was the common theme that ran through for you and the emotion right. that it brought to you. Right. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you got to be published, <laughs> because I'm told it's not by the traditional method. And you have been published before, correct? Yeah, I've been published in a lot of periodicals and literary magazines throughout my life, you know, probably maybe 25 or 30 um, individual publications of my poems. but. I never really thought about getting a collection together until like the last few years, I'd say. I was thinking, you know, it's time. So I, Ann and I put this collection together and um, I started sending it out to places like that do publications. And so this was one of the places I sent it to, which was, <coughs> excuse me, Brickhouse Press. But they had a Wicked Women's Poetry Competition, and I thought, that fits me. <laughs> so, so tell me about that. Well, I saw it in, um, I think it might have been online, and this was their first contest. And um, it was started by uh, a woman. And um, so uh, they were just looking for, they wanted to publish and give an award to a woman who had exceeded all expectations. <laughs> That's so here I am. <laughs> but, um, so I sent my poems in. And then about, I don't know, six months later, I guess, I got this email and saying, this isn't, a, it's official. You'll get an official notice, but I couldn't wait to tell you that you won this award. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, oh, Really? Huh. <laughs> so I said, Ann, this is a joke, right? <laughs> and she read it and said, no, this is for real. So that's how it happened. So I won the competition. I got the um, honorarium for winning, and I got the book published. So that's sort of how it happened. So and you're <clears throat> now going to set, because this is the first, you're setting the standard for everyone that comes following you. Yes. You are again <laughs> being a trailblazer. Yeah. yeah. It, and they're sending you out <coughs> on a brief tour to promote this, correct? Well, no, I went down to where they are. Which in, is? Which, Washington, D.C. And we had a wonderful award ceremony, a luncheon, and a reading. It was fabulous. And as for doing it, I'm, I've been doing it on my own after that. And oh. so I read in Chelsea uh, last week, which was fantastic. I... Um, I'm going to read in Malpelia in November. I read in Burlington, and I'm going to read in New York City. So, um, New York City, that will be exciting. That will be very exciting. Very okay. exciting. So, what happened? Now that you have a published collection, what comes next? 
well, I just keep writing and um, maybe try to get another collection together and see what happens. Okay. So, so we will be talking more about the Kellogg Cobra when we talk about right. events. But I would like you to read another poem. Okay. And there's one in particular that looking, reading your work, it was, this is Linda. So if okay. you would. And the poem is called Almost <laughs> Old. And the joke I usually make about this is that when I wrote this, I was almost old. Now I'm closer to almost old. <laughs> so um, here it is. The hitch to being, to almost being old, is the idea of Florida. Strip malls and strippers, a restaurant or two next to Walmart, or the villages where Mitt Romney spoke of better days. 25 years ago, I took a train to New Orleans and stayed there for 14 years, living a dystopian life, held up at gunpoint twice. The smell of jasmine stayed with me even when the police came three days later. Anne Rice in a coffin for Halloween and vampires in the humid mist. I can't just go anywhere anymore. 50 years ago, I moved to Aspen with four friends in a Jeep. The heated winter pool, lights, and skiers. My first girl love. I left for San Francisco before AIDS, touching the hands of long-haired strangers. I could have found Charlie Manson in Peace Park among the girls I laughed with. Now, Montpelier, Vermont, the smell of winter air and moaning mornings. I think of Florida, take a nap, reliving times with old friends and saying final goodbyes, words I might have forgotten. Thank you. What did, being the trailblazer you are now, what advice do you have for lesbian poets coming up behind you? Read a lot of poetry, um, find some good mentors. I had some fabulous ones. Okay. Um, and um, just keep doing it. No matter what they say, no matter how hard it seems, just keep doing it. All right. So Linda's reading is going to be <coughs> Monday, November 4th. 7 p.m. at the Kellogg Hubbard Library here in Montpelier. And I want to leave with this. And this was one of the reviews of Chelsea Creek, that it renders the rough terrain of working class New England with a lush beauty that pulls no punches, letting the brute hardness of a place and its people coexist with a longing and love, finding the tenderness Hiding Inside Tragedy. If you would like to hear more, please come join us on the 4th. Thank you, Keith. Congratulations. Thank you. That well, was fun. Yeah, that was fun. Now we go to trivia. Now we go to trivia. Okay, so October 2006, Out in the Mountains, Vermont Supreme Court, Miller Jenkins decision. People who have been in Vermont for a while. This is the lesbian custody case. <coughs> mm -hmm. They entered into a civil union. One of the partners had a daughter by alternative insemination. The partner then said, oops, I'm not really a lesbian. I found Christ <laughs> and moved to Virginia and then ensued a long legal process Didn't the, of... Didn't the minister who helped her go to prison? Yes. Okay. What happened was in Virginia, she tried to file for sole custody of the daughter. The Virginia court originally granted it. It was challenged because, oh no, this was not a Virginia custody case. It originated in Vermont. Vermont had jurisdiction. Right. Vermont ordered visitation, which was not honored. So Miller 
took the daughter and with the help of the Mennonite minister yeah. went to New York, Canada, El Salvador, and then they believe Nicaragua. And that minister and the associates they went to were, jail over there. They were convicted. 27 months they yeah. served. But here is what really did them in and why the federal process at that time, which was honoring justice, <laughs> they had a Twitter feed encouraging people and supporting the kidnapping of children from same-sex household and smuggling them to normal homes. Oh. So, and, and this is still unresolved. It's mm. been 19 years, but this young woman has not seen both parents since 2000. They're still hiding in Nicaragua, right? They or believe, wherever they, they are. They believe Nicaragua. Yeah. So, with that... Well, that, I think, more than ever and always, we need to resist. resist.